It is now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My uh, question is for the uh, Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Auditor General confirmed what the PC caucus has been saying all along that this government has made a mess of the energy file. The global adjustment tax is yet another grab at Ontarians' wallets cooked up by this government to cover the outrageous costs and losses of the failed Green Energy Act. Ontarians have been duped out of $50 billion, that's five times the current provincial deficit, and hydro bills are at record highs. Premier, the Auditor General has said the global adjustment tax has been a bad deal for Ontarians. Do you believe the Auditor is wrong about this one too? Well, Mr. Speaker, I know that the Minister of Energy is going to want to uh, comment on the specifics, but let me just talk about what we have been doing yeah. in the energy this system for the last few years, Mr. Speaker, because when we came into office, the energy system in Ontario was in a serious state of disarray. Yeah. So what we've been doing is we've been modernizing the electricity system across the province. We've invested $11 billion since order. 2003 in systems across the province, Mr. Speaker. Member from Renfrew, we've come upgraded order. over 10,000 kilometers of power lines that had been neglected, work that had not been done, infrastructure that had not been uh, upgraded, Mr. Speaker, and we've taken that on. We've re rebuilt 12,000 megawatts of uh, new, cleaner power for Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the green energy strategy has created $24 billion in private uh, sector investment, Mr. Speaker. So, in fact, people in Ontario have the power that they need, Mr. Speaker. It, Mr. Speaker, it's predictable, and we, at the same time, we have made it reliable across the province, Mr. Speaker. Premier, the Auditor General found that the global adjustment tax on electricity bills has increased by. 1,200% since it was first introduced by your government. The Auditor General confirmed that nearly 60% of this $50 billion, or $30 billion, goes towards paying for wind turbines and solar panels wow. in your outrageous subsidies to that industry. It's a double slap in the face to rural communities like the ones many of us represent. Residents are stuck footing the bill for wind turbines they never wanted in the first place, while their hydro bills skyrocket. The Auditor General's report is further proof that the Green Energy Act has been a complete failure. Your global adjustment tax is the only thing that has kept the Green Energy Act on life support. And so, Premier, will you admit that the Green Energy Act is a failure and pull the plug on your failed energy policy? Thank you. Thank you. Premier? Minister of Energy? Mr. Speaker, the global adjust adjustment are calculations that are made as part of the pricing policy that exists in jurisdictions across North America and the world, Mr. Speaker. What it is is the real price of energy, Mr. Speaker, and by that I mean there are certain things that are not included in the market price uh, that's out there day after day. For example, Mr. Speaker, the costs of the independent electricity system operator. They don't actually engage in the creation of generation, but they manage and operate the system, Mr. Speaker, and their costs go into the global adjustment as part of the cost of the energy system. Mr. Speaker, as well, many of the costs Order, of conservation, please. Mr. Speaker, are not relevant to the market price of electricity, yes, and the Ontario Energy Board approves those costs. The cost of the IESO, Mr. Speaker, uh, and, and the, the other costs that, uh, that relate. Thank you. Final supplementary. You know, since you brought this global, I back to the Premier, since you brought the global uh, adjustment tax, which is a tax that didn't exist when we were in office, you brought it in in 2006. Ontarians, according to the Auditor General, have paid $10,000. By this time next year, they will have paid $10,000. So $1,000 a year extra on a new tax that you brought in. And the minister says it's to pay for the OPA, the Ontario Power Authority, or the IESO, uh, or new transmission. Those things were paid for in the cost of electricity when we were in power. We didn't have an extra tax. The reason you brought in the extra $50 billion tax is you needed a way Order. Sneaky, sneakily uh, to hide, I should say, uh, your green energy, the subsidy to your green energy policy. So when all of those things that the minister is talking about were once paid for Question. the regular rate of electricity. You needed another, the auditor says, $30 billion to subsidize Mr. McGinney's and now Ms. Wynne's Thank you. Premier's plan. Will you get rid of the Thank you. Stop the Green Energy Act? Thank you. Stop the Thank you. Stop the 
please? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, renewable energy represents about 8% of the bill, Mr. Speaker. It is, it is, it is a smaller portion of the bill. Member from Speaker. Oxford, come to order. There have been significant investments made in the energy sector, Mr. Speaker, because we had a deficit of electricity and we had dirty coal burning, Mr. Member Speaker. Member from Huron, Bruce, come and in to order. order. To rebuild the system, to make it clean and reliable, Mr. Speaker, we invested in hydroelectric. We invested in the tunnel in Niagara, Mr. Speaker. We in invested in the Lower Mattagamy River, $2.6 billion. Member from Renfrew, come to order, prices, second time. Mr. Speaker, and we have put in mitigation measures to deal with those. The steps that we had to take to invest $31 billion is the $31 billion in transmission and generation that the previous government refused to invest, Mr. Speaker, that created a deficit and a very dirty system. Answer. Mr. Speaker, the, if the fresh prices come from their negligence in the past, Mr. Speaker, and we're resolving it. New question. The Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, again, for the uh, Premier. <clears throat> Premier, following the release of the Auditor General's report, your Energy Minister tried to deflect responsibility by discrediting the work undertaken by an independent officer of this Legislature. His actions were, Deputy House Leader, come to order. were also very unacceptable. On your Minister's watch, Ontarians are paying billions of dollars extra for electricity thanks to a flawed smart meter program and above market rates the province pays most power generators and most of those power generators are under your Green Energy Act. Premier, you remain committed to the Global Adjustment Tax. You refuse to take up to tear up the Green Energy Act. Will you at least make one smart energy decision and fire your energy minister? Here, here, here. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, as I said a number of times yesterday, the decisions that we have made around the energy system, uh, including smart meters, Mr. Speaker, have modernized and upgraded the energy system. Mr. Speaker, we made investments in transmission lines. We've uh, produced and invested in more clean power. From Lanark, and smart meters, Mr. Speaker, have allowed us to have data that we would not have otherwise. And, Mr. Speaker, I know that the, uh, the leader of the third party knows that people who work in the system and people who are experts in the system believe that the smart meters have given us data that's important and have allowed conservation to take place across the province, Mr. Speaker. Um, the, uh, the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario, another officer of the Legislature, said about smart meters, they are necessary, absolutely necessary, for the proper yes, functioning sir. and future functioning of the distribution system for electricity, and he goes on to talk about smart grid technology. Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker, we've made very good decisions on Thank you. Supplementary. Again, to the Premier, Premier the Auditor General's report is tough medicine for the government. Sometimes you need to admit your mistakes, swallow the medicine, and spend time in the penalty box. During my time as a senior cabinet minister, I had to make tough decisions, and I stepped aside when it was appropriate, and I did so voluntarily. The Auditor's report on Liberal government programs is loaded with examples of gross incompetence, waste and mismanagement, costing Ontarians billions and billions of dollars. And nowhere is this more evident than in the Ministry of Energy. Premier, are you willing to take the tough medicine and demand that your energy minister resign? It's the right Mr. Speaker, I know that the Minister of Energy is going to want to comment in the final supplementary, but as I said yesterday, you know, on the vast, uh, vast majority of the recommendations and the concerns that the Auditor General raised, we are in full agreement. We're working with the Auditor General, or we have already begun to work on the concerns that uh, that she identifies. But, Mr. Speaker, as the Minister of Energy said yesterday, there was a professional disagreement on some very narrow aspects of the concerns that uh, the Auditor General raised. Those have been expressed. The uh, the conversation between the Minister of Energy and the uh, uh, Auditor General have been just that. They've been professional. And, Mr. Speaker, it is not the first time in the history of this legislature that there has been a disagreement between a government and yeah, an officer of the legislature, Mr. Speaker. So I think that the, uh, the leader of the uh, opposition needs to look back in history and needs to understand that that kind of healthy professional dialogue actually is in the best interest of the people of the province. Again, to the Premier. Uh, the takeaway, Premier, from the Auditor General's line-by-line -line investigations are that Ontario can't afford to go on like this. From patients to pensioners, from families with children to our most vulnerable residents in need, hard-working taxpayers are not getting value for the essential public services they rely on. 
Spending continues to skyrock, skyrocket on your government's watch while accountability and service delivery continues to plummet. The Auditor General now joins the Conference Board of Canada, the Ontario Chamber of Commerce and the PC Caucus, who have all raised serious red flags about your government's out-of-control spending. Following the release of the AG's report, no one believes you will balance the budget by 2017-2018. Premier, if you aren't willing to fire your energy minister over the Auditor, Auditor General's findings, would you give Ontarians a Question. Christmas present, present and tell us who the heck is going to take responsibility for the mess you've made in this place? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to address the uh, Auditor General's report. Uh, there are some significant professional disagreements uh, with respect to the report. And Mr. Speaker, uh, one of the one of the areas of disagreement is the is the uh, position in the report Member that for Hamilton, most East Stony of Creek, the anticipated order. benefits of smart meters have not been achieved. Well, where the professional disagreement starts, Mr. Speaker, is with the Environmental Commission of Ontario that says smart meters are a shrewd investment that will benefit both individual consumers of power and society as a whole. Mr. Speaker, if we want to go to Anthony Haynes, President and CEO of Toronto Hydro, that smart meter program is the best thing we've done in a decade. I'm telling you the smart meter program was a deal changer. That was the entry into intelligent use of energy. And he also confirmed at the, uh, at the press conference the other day, Mr. Answer. Speaker, that there is a 3% reduction in the use in, on, in, the, in the city of Toronto, which is a very, very significant savings. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Ontario's energy system is in a hot mess. Hydro bills are going up. The Auditor General says we're not reducing energy consumption. And it turns out the $1 billion smart meter plan, Speaker, was actually the Liberals' $2 billion not so smart meter plan. Right. If a regular person went a $1 billion <laughs> over budget, on a project speaker, that person would be fired. Right. Why is this Liberal minister getting away with this and able to keep his job? So, Mr. Speaker, again, I challenge the premise of the question. The fact is that the changes that we have made in the energy system mean that it has been modernized, that infrastructure that had been neglected has been upgraded, that we have a cleaner, more renewable energy system in, in the province, Mr. Speaker. It's more reliable, and people across the province have access to the power that they need, Mr. Speaker. In terms of the smart meters, the decision to have smart meters across the province has meant that there is data that is available to the system that was not Remember available from Stormont, before, come to order. and that people are able to conserve in ways that they were not able to conserve before. 3 percent shift of power off peak time, Mr. Speaker, in the City of Toronto alone. That's the equivalent of the power needed for 97 condominium buildings, Mr. Speaker. That's a significant Answer. reduction in the use of power, and we're able to do that because of the introduction of smart meters. Thank you. Speaker, Speaker, the fact is the Liberals promised that smart meters would help people reduce their bills. Yeah. Instead, even people who are doing the right thing or trying to do the right thing by doing their laundry at midnight are paying 114 per cent more. Wow. This is incompetence, Speaker. There is no other way to describe it. People are paying the price for this incompetence. My question to this Premier is, why is her minister not paying the price for his incompetence? Well, again, Mr. Speaker, I will, um, I will once again uh, just read into the record some of the uh, some of the comments that were made about the introduction of smart meters by people who are who actually know what's going on, Mr. Speaker, and are actually seeing. And there's no doubt, Mr. Speaker, that there have been increases in the cost of electricity, as there have been in jurisdictions all over North America and uh, and the world, Mr. Speaker. But the fact is that we are taking steps to mitigate the those increases, Mr. Speaker. 
Speaker. We have renegotiated uh, contracts, Mr. Speaker. We have made changes, including putting smart meters in place so that people can conserve. So uh, Anthony Haynes, who's the president and CEO of Toronto Hydro, says we've seen about a 3 percent shift off the peak here in the city of Toronto. 3 percent is 97 condominium buildings, 97 condominium buildings that came on the grid over the same period of time. We didn't have to make any additional capital investment because that shift of the 3 percent provided that capacity within our grid. That's a cost saving, Mr. Speaker. That's power that didn't have to be built. Thank you. Member from Hamilton East Stony Creek, bring it down. Please continue. Supplementary. Speaker, under the Liberals' watch, the electricity system in this province has become a colossal mess. The global adjustment charge has increased by 1,200 per cent in 10 years. Ontarians are paying three times the market price for electricity. The Liberals are not reducing electricity consumption in this province. Hydro One customers, Speaker, have received astronomical bills for electricity that they didn't even use. And the list, unfortunately, sadly, goes on and on and on. In the real world, Speaker, people get fired for this kind of laundry list of failure. Will the Premier finally Deputy do House the right Leader thing on the last day of this time. session and tell her Minister, it's time to go and Question. ask him for his resignation. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, the uh, leader of the third party obviously knows more than Anthony Haynes, who's the CEO of the second largest uh, distribution company in the province, who came before the press conference two days ago, Mr. Speaker, and outlined that in the city of Toronto, there's been a 3% reduction in consumption as a result of smart meters, Mr. Speaker, allowing a lot more money to be invested in the system. Mr. Speaker, as well, the Ontario Energy Board had the Navigant study, which showed that the costs per customer are estimated to be approximately $12 per year lower because of load shifting and conservation driven by smart meter enabled time of use pricing. Mr. Speaker, over three years, that represents approximately $150 million in savings, which have not been accounted for by the Auditor General. Mr. Speaker, Answer. we are saving dollars. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. This session began with an unprecedented display of arrogance and ended with an even greater display of arrogance by this government. It began with the Liberals using time allocation Order. to shut down debate and to shut Ontarians out of committee hearings. And it ended with the Liberals condescending and sexist attack on the Auditor General. I have Thank you. Please finish. I have to ask this Premier Speaker, is that what we can continue to expect from her Liberal government in the weeks and years to come? Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker, let me address the, uh, the first part of the question first, and then I'll speak to the second part. Uh, to the first part of the question, when we came back into uh, the legislature, Mr. Speaker, after the election, we made it clear that uh, legislation that had been on the order paper, that we had been working to get through, that had had hours and hours of discussion, Mr. Speaker, that we were going to work now in this parliament to move through more quickly because there was a backlog and there was work that really needed to be done, like, like the uh, modernization of the child care system, Mr. Speaker, which resulted out of a concern to keep keep kids safer in the system. So we have Order. I will not apologize Mr. Speaker for working very hard to move legislation through. We have provided The member from Timmins James Bay and the member from Leeds Grenville will come to order. And if you do that again, I'll jump right to a warning. Please why we have worked very hard, it's true, to get legislation moved through this legislature, Mr. Speaker, and uh, and I'm very proud of the amount of legislation that we've been able to uh, to move through the through the process. I'll address the second part in the supplementary. Order, 
please. Thank you. Supper. Speaker. You know, throughout this session, yeah. Liberals have been trying to whitewash the gas plant scandal. But the OPP speaker is still investigating the deletion of gas plant emails. In fact, the OPP detectives yet again railed government, uh, raided rather government offices just a few weeks ago in November. But Laura Miller and Peter Feist, two Liberal insiders who are frankly at the centre of this scandal, are still being protected. As this session closes, I have to wonder, is this the brand, the Liberal brand of transparency and accountability that we're going to continue to see from this order. Liberal Premier and her government? Thank you. So, Premier. Mr. Speaker, you know, again, the, the questions are all over the map, but let me just let me just pick up on the transparency and accountability because this is a member, the leader of the third party, who has been calling for increased accountability, Mr. Speaker. Apparently, that is what she wants to believe is her brand. But, Mr. Speaker, her party sat in their place and did not support Bill 8, which is the Accountability Act, Mr. Speaker, which actually expands, expands the scope of the, uh, of the uh, Ombudsman, Mr. Speaker, sets up a, a system within the health care system of a the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek is warned. The President of the Treasury Board will come to order. Now, let me be clear, in case it wasn't heard, the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek is warned. Carry on. That Accountability Act, Mr. Speaker, will Answer. put in place a uh, patient ombudsman and would put caps in place on, uh, on executive salaries. They voted against that, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Final supplementary. Yes, that was a yes, Speaker. While the Premier continues to support, or rather, to protect Liberal insiders and the Liberal cabinet ministers, she continues to support them and protect them too. She is actually hurting Ontarians, Speaker. She's slashing six percent out of nearly every ministry. Member she's cutting schools. Lawrence, she's cutting order. schools. She's cutting health care. Uh, she's cutting child care. Families are paying higher hydro and gas prices, while the CEOs in this province get new H. ST loopholes to take to the bank. And people on OW and ODSP are worried that the problems that the Premier has created Minister of Economic are still Development, not come to order. fixed. The Premier continues with the gas plant cover-up, Speaker. When will this Premier start actually standing up? No, I would ask you to withdraw. Cover up, cover up. Oh, okay. Uh, I withdraw. Uh, uh, when will the, the Premier continue uh, to, uh, uh, to not be uh, forthcoming on what the Liberal involvement was with the gas plant scandal? So, my question is, when will the Premier actually start standing up for the people of Ontario instead of the Liberal Party? Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> standing up for the people of Ontario, building Ontario up, working to get legislation passed that is going to improve business and people's lives in this province. Legislation like reduction of red tape, legislation like modernization of childcare, legislation like the Accountability Act that will put more accountability into the system, Mr. Speaker. Legislation like indexing the minimum wage so that yeah. the minimum wage will go up as the cost of living goes up, Mr. Speaker. Health care protections like pharmacy safety, blood donation safety, Mr. Speaker, legislation that will remove costs from the auto insurance system so that auto insurance rates will continue to go down. That's the work that we're doing on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker. So it seems to me that that legislation is legis all of that is legislation that the leader of the third party should have supported, and we will continue to work to make sure that that kind of improvement is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Order, please. New question. The member from Renfrew, Nicholson, Pembroke. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Energy. Minister, yesterday we saw in this House a doubling down of your abysmal administration of the energy system and your unprecedented attack on the Auditor General. Today, 
The only thing piling up faster than the snow outside are your excuses for your failed energy policies. On Tuesday, we got confirmation from the AG that your smart meter fiasco will cost energy consumers double what you claim. Smart meters haven't cut consumption at peak times, and often they don't even relay the information back to the central data center. Minister, this is your chance to admit the errors of your government's policies and take responsibility for this smart meter scandal, Question. which has piled up on top of scandal after scandal after scandal for your government. Will you Thank take you. responsibility? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, uh, I do want to address some of the challenges in the, in the electricity system. As I said, we've made major investments. Smart meters is one of them, Mr. Speaker, and we've provided all of those quotes. But where were the seeds of this challenge that we have in the energy oh, sector? Like Mr. Speaker, Hansard, December 1, 2003. Frank Cleese, former member from Aurora. Well, there's one reason that we accumulated that debt in this province under the hydro ledger. And that is that people in this province for years have not been paying the true cost of electricity. Uh, it was in fact being subsidized and a pox on all the previous governments that allowed that to happen. That includes Conservative governments. And Mr. Speaker, a quote from uh, the uh, then MPP uh, Energy Minister, former en Energy Minister Jim Wilson. Oh. This summer, when we didn't have enough electricity yes, in this province because we hit peak heat temperatures and all the air conditioners were running, we had to buy power. I had to pay $7 million one day. Thank you. Supplementary. You should be buying power. As I said, Speaker, more excuses, no answers. Minister, your failure to accept responsibility for yet Both sides. Bring it down. Please finish. Mr. Your failure to accept responsibility for yet another energy scandal leads me to believe that you're the one going to be receiving a lump of coal in your stopping, stocking this Christmas. Yeah. In another one of your boondoggles, the Auditor General found that from 2006 to 2013, the global adjustment. Now, that is the difference between the price of energy and the cost of the energy contracts you have signed for expensive, unreliable power. The global adjustment increased by 1,200 per cent, while the average market price for energy decreased by 46 per cent. That amounts to a, 50, a staggering $50 billion charge on the backs of energy consumers in the province of Ontario. Minister, since you won't accept responsibility Question. for this scandal and all of the other scandalous policies of your government, will you finally do the right thing and resign? Thank you. Okay. You seated, please. You seated, please. Start the clock. Minister. Mr. Speaker, before the global adjustment, wholesale market prices were insufficient to cover the cost of contract payments to certain electricity generators, yeah, leading the government to accumulate billions of dollars in debt, part of the debt I referred to earlier that had been accumulated by the previous government. This contributed to the stranded debt that Ontario consumers continue to pay pay off to the debt retirement charge. Mr. That? Speaker, the global adjustment is, uh, is allowing the cost of the system to be recovered. Previously, they were accumulating debt, Mr. Speaker, and it's the stranded debt House that Leader. is on our hydro bills today, which Leader. we are going to remove two years earlier, Mr. Speaker, which that government voted against. Thank that party voted against. Thank you. Two questions. A member from Kitchener, Waterloo. Hello, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, thanks to the Auditor General, we now know that 74 infrastructure projects in Ontario could have been built for $28 billion rather than $36 billion that this Liberal government spent using the P3 model. I want to quote the Auditor General, the very competent and qualified Auditor General. Costs were estimated to be nearly $8 billion higher under the alternative financing and procurement approach than they were estimated to have been if the projects had been delivered by the public sector. 
$6.5 billion of this overpayment is a direct result of paying excessive interest rates on money borrowed from the highly profitable Canadian and international banks. Yesterday, the Premier continued to defend this $8 billion boondoggle, despite overwhelming evidence that these projects should be built and financed through the public sector. When will the Premier admit Question. that her P3 program is nothing more than a massive gift to some of the world's largest banks? Paid for by Thank the hard-working people of this province. Thank you. Minister, Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, I would have hoped that the member opposite was listening yesterday when I referred her leader uh, to the to the heart of the uh, of the auditor report, where there's a graph that completely explains, Mr. Speaker, that you can't just talk about a cost. You have to talk about a benefit. When you talk about a cost of transferring risk of $8 billion, Mr. Speaker, you got to talk about the cost of, of a, that, that to the tax or the benefit to the taxpayer of a $14 billion transfer of risk, which means, Mr. Speaker, in, in the Auditor General's report, a $6.6 billion savings to the taxpayer. It's not that complicated, Mr. Speaker. It's right in the Auditor General's report. I'm going to ask a page, if I can, Mr. Mr. Speaker, to bring it over to the member opposite, and I'd be happy, Answer. Mr. Speaker, to have my officials brief her to make sure, Mr. Speaker, that they understand when Thank they you. talk about a cost. Thank you. Supplementary. You know, it's, really, it's interesting. The minister is right. It isn't that complicated. There is no factual basis, no empirical evidence for that number that's attached to the re retained risks. I have that document, and the auditor wrote it, and she was right. Speaker, the minister or the premier can use any number that they want to defend their P3 giveaways because we know that they're all fiction anyway. I just want to return to the numbers because the numbers don't lie. From my initial minister, question, 74 infrastructure projects cost $36 billion instead of $28 billion. That's a 20 per cent premium. We cannot afford that, Mr. Speaker. The fact is that the numbers being spun by the Premier and the Minister are every bit as made up of the so-called value for money audits that the auditor said there was no evidence for, and we believe the auditor. Speaker, this is another example of this Liberals' government habit of desperate and unconvincing attempts to spin the numbers. When will this government admit that its P3 program is a colossal failure and end this massive drain on the public treasury? Minister. Mr. Speaker, under the AFP program to date, 37 pro projects uh, near, near completion or at completion, 97 per cent of those projects on budget, Mr. Speaker, 97 per cent. That is an unprecedented record, not only for Ontario, everywhere, Mr. Speaker, in the industrialized world. So, Mr. Speaker, for her to suggest that Infrastructure Ontario is failing the Remember people of this province is blatantly incorrect. No, no, no. The member from Kitchener Waterloo will come to order. Please finish. Mr. Speaker, in terms of the value for money system of analyzing risk, 19 of 20 OECD countries use that very same uh, method, Mr. Speaker, methodology. 40 countries Answer. have come here, Mr. Speaker, to learn from us. We're the best in the world, Mr. Speaker, but we're going to get even better at doing this. Thank and you. that's why we do accept the Question, the from Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. Transit is incredibly important for those living in my community in Davenport. Those living in Davenport want to know that they have access to reliable and affordable travel options, whether they are traveling to school. The member from Hamilton East Stony Creek will withdraw. The member from Hamilton East Stony Creek will withdraw. But I withdraw. Hamilton East, Stony Creek will simply withdraw. I withdraw. Carry on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I was saying, those living in Davenport want to know that they have access to reliable and affordable travel options, whether they are traveling to school, to work, or even to the airport. I know that yesterday the minister, along with the premier, joined Metrolink CEO Bruce McQuaid in announcing the fares for the Union Pearson Express. Question. I understand that there has been a lot of discussion in regards to the UP Express fares lately, and I know that those living in my community are interested in learning more on this topic. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please provide members of Thank this you. House with details on yesterday's—
Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Davenport for this question and for all of her hard work. And, Speaker, I also want to say, unlike perhaps the member from Timmins, James Bay, those of us on this side of the House value every single member who represents the community. Speaker, Speaker, that member is quite correct. There has been a lot of discussion regarding the fares for the Up Express, as we call it, and that's why I was very happy to stand alongside the Premier, along with representatives from Metrolinx and the Greater Toronto Airports Authority yesterday to discuss, uh, to announce, in fact, Speaker, the, uh, the fares. Uh, as people might know, Speaker Metrolinx has proposed an adult fare of $19 for Presto card users. There are also a number of other variable pricing options that have been proposed, including a $10 fare for airport workers, a discounted fare for students and seniors, variable fares for those getting on or off at different stations, and free access to the Up Express Question, uh, for answer, children sorry. under the age of six. This fare structure will allow us to balance revenue and capacity, ensuring enough ridership to allow Up Express to become self-financing within three to five years. Thanks Thank very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the minister for his response, and I know that my constituents in Davenport have been very interested in learning more about the Union Pearson Express fare structure. You mentioned that it is important that the UP Express be self-financing, something which will ensure the financial viability of the service for many years to come. But those living in Davenport will want to know how the UP Express will be different than other options currently available, like the TTC and taxis. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please provide members of this House with more specifics on how the UP Express will help travellers in my community? Thank you, Minister. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Once again, I thank the member from Davenport for her thoughtful question. The UP Express was designed as a dedicated express link for air travellers, offering fast and predictable service. This means a guaranteed travel time of 25 minutes for riders, as well as, well as trains arriving every 15 minutes, 19 and a half hours per day. The service will also provide travellers with amenities that make their journey easier, such as airline check-in kiosks, luggage racks, and up-to-the-minute flight information. Travellers will choose Up Express because it's faster, more reliable, and less expensive than any other direct airport to downtown modes of transportation they may be using. TTC, Go Transit, personal vehicles, taxis, and limousines will all continue to provide a wide range of alternatives for travellers and those working at or near the airport. Speaker, once again, we are very excited about this service that's being delivered on time and on budget, and we know that in the spring Sir. when it's operating, the people of this region will be excited as well. Thanks very much, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Your question, member for Lennox, Fort Mac, Lennox, and Attica. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Infrastructure. Minister, yesterday I attended both the technical briefing provided by your ministry as well as your announcement regarding the future of Mars Phase 2. I was astonished that you accepted the expert panel's recommendation to sink an additional $86 million wow. into the project. What concerns me most about the mess you made is the risk that you've put taxpayers at by spending an additional one-third of the building's value. Your goal to have Mars replace your loan with a commercial loan is more wishful than realistic. Minister, will you confirm to this House that even if leased up, the government will only receive repayment on the loan and not the $65 million bailout to ARE or the extra $86 million you blew yesterday? That's Question. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to begin by thanking Michael Nabrega and Carol Stevenson for the great work that they've done on behalf of Ontario taxpayers, Mr. Speaker, and on behalf of those of us in this legislature that want to continue to grow a strong economy, who want to continue to invest in our bioscience cluster, and want to continue, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that Ontario remains a global centre for innovation and growth. Mr. Speaker, their advice, which comes from many, many decades of experience, is advice that provides us with a very solid business plan to ensure, Mr. Speaker, that the investments we've made in Mars are fully secured, fully protected, to ensure, Mr. Speaker, that the loan that we have made will be paid back in full with interest, and to ensure, Mr. Speaker, that this project will now be finished, Answer. the jobs will be created, Mr. Speaker, and this will continue to be an Ontario success story. I'm glad, Mr. Speaker, for that advice, Thank you. and I'm glad the government's decided. Seated, please. Minister, you can spout all you want about your positive vision for a building, but at the end of the day, it's our party over here that is the only one that cares about the taxpayer. Right. Your government has blown $400 million to build a building we never needed, only to fill it with even more government-funded institutions. 
Minister, your announcement yesterday confirmed what we've been saying all along. The only way you would fill this building is by leasing it to government-funded tenants. At the end of the day, we are just funding them to pay you. That's not a good business model, Minister, but we already knew there never was a business case for Mars. Minister, will you tell this House today what percentage of tenants or those who have signed letters of intent are private companies that receive no government funding? Question. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, on one hand, we have the advice of two of the most esteemed people in our business community who have decades of experience in these kind of transactions. On the other hand, we have the advice of the member opposite. Mr. Speaker, call me crazy, but I'm taking the advice of the expert panel, and the opposition will be happy to do that, Mr. Speaker. The opposition will be very happy to do that. But I and this government are taking the advice of the expert panel, Order. Mr. Speaker, because it's a good business plan. It's good business advice. Mr. Speaker, the party opposite, when this project was having challenges, wanted to let a building at college and university rot in the ground, wanted to let this potential building that's going to generate jobs and economic development go to absolute waste. Answer. Mr. Speaker, that would have been the wrong thing to do then. It would have been the wrong thing to do now. We're taking the advice of the Thank expert you. panel, and we're moving forward. Mr. Any questions? The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. A tragic boating accident in the Sudbury area caused the deaths of three people last year. The only survivor was Rob Dorzik, who lost his spouse and two of his close friends. The president of the Sudbury Professional Firefighters Association has said there were, quote, major deficiencies in the emergency response system that evening. Mr. Dorzik, the people of Sudbury and the professional firefighters have all asked for an inquest into this tragedy, Speaker. Will the Premier do the right thing and support the people of Sudbury by demanding an inquest into this tragedy? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services will want to comment on the, uh, on the supplementary. Um, I want to ensure everyone here today that this is an issue that we take very, very seriously. I understand that the Minister of, uh, of, of Safety and Correctional Services met with the Sudbury uh, Firefighters Association this morning, and I had an opportunity to uh, speak to two of the members uh, there. And, and I would like to thank the first responders for the hard work that they do uh, all over the province, including in Sudbury, to keep community safe. And my deepest condolences, Mr. Speaker, go to the family and friends of the victims of this tragic incident. Obviously, it is a, it is a tragedy. Um, and while the, uh, the regional supervising coroner decided not to call an inquest into the matter, Mr. Speaker, it's important to note that the family of the deceased may appeal this decision to the office of the chief uh, coroner of Ontario, Mr. Answer. Speaker, and so um, we will let that, uh, let that process unfold. Thank you, Supplementary. Speaker, after meeting with your ministry representatives or with the government's uh, ministry representatives, Mr. Dorsick and the families involved still feel that they have been receiving conflicting stories on this matter. These families and the people of Sudbury need assurances that they can actually trust their emergency response systems. An internal report by the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care outlined an emergency response system that is rife with miscommunication and with confusion. The people in the Sudbury area need to know that when they dial 911, they're going to receive the help that they need. The Chief Coroner's Office is under the purview of this Liberal government. Instead of asking these families to go through more paperwork, why will this Premier not do the right thing and just call for the inquest? Question, thank you. Minister of Community Safety and Correction Services. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I thank the member opposite for the, for the question. And let me first of all, foremost, uh, uh, share all our condolences in this house for the tragic in incident. Uh, accident that took place in, in Sudbury and, and uh, those who lost their lives. Uh, obviously, our thoughts goes to the family. I think, Speaker, the, the member opposite knows very well that uh, that I, as the Minister of 
Community Safety and Correctional Services or the government does not have the, the power or the capacity uh, to ask the coroner uh, to conduct an inquest. It's an independent arm's length decision making uh, process and it's uh, totally up to the coroner to make that determination. As the Premier mentioned, uh, it, it is up to the family to, uh, to avail, the, uh, avail the appeal process um, and uh, my understanding is that the families may be uh, doing this. But Speaker, this is a very serious issue and we take it very uh, yes, seriously. I had a great opportunity to meet with uh, Sudbury firefighters and I look forward to continue to work with them to ensure that we restore the faith Thank and you. confidence in, uh, in emergency management in Sudbury. Thank you. New question. Uh, the member from Newmarket Aurora. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, my question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, it's fundamentally important uh, that our government protect the voluntary blood donation system. Every year, thousands of Ontarians voluntarily give blood and plasma to help other, uh, others survive accidents, surgery, and life-threatening conditions. Voluntary donation is, a, is an important pillar of our nation's public blood system. In fact, I know many of my constituents in Newmarket Aurora are regular blood donors and have been asking about this new legislation passed yesterday. I'm very proud of our uh, voluntary life-saving uh, blood donation system, and I'm also proud of the care health care professionals in Ontario provide patients every day. I encourage all Ontarians to donate blood if they're able to do Question. so. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I ask the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care to tell us about the importance of protecting the integrity of our voluntary blood donation system and why thank this you. bill was so important to pass. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And it's true, yesterday our government passed Bill 21, Safeguarding Health Care Integrity Act 2014. And this bill combines our government's action, actions to safeguard our voluntary blood and plasma donation system in the province, as well as the regulation of hospital pharmacies to strengthen oversight and improve patient safety. Now, Health Canada had received license applications from at least one private for-profit company seeking to open plasma collection sites in Ontario that would pay people for their plasma, a component of blood. However, Health Canada has left the decision to permit or prohibit payment for blood or plasma donations to the individual provinces and territories. So our government took action, and we heard from many health care organizations, advocacy groups, and individual Ontarians who were opposed to private for-profit plasma collection. And as a government, we agree, and we stand firmly yes, against payment for blood or plasma donations in Ontario, and that's reflected in the legislation that passed yesterday with unanimous support. Thank, Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary. Yes, it certainly did pass with unanimous consent. Congratulations. I, I heard the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care reference the second part of the bill that I've not yet had the opportunity to ask about. My constituents in Newmarket and Aurora were shocked by the news last year that over a thousand patients in Ontario received weaker doses of chemotherapy drugs than had been prescribed by their oncologist. That was a very serious incident. No one should ever have to go th through what uh, those cancer patients and their families went through. I know that Dr. Jake Thiessen was appointed to review the incident and to lead a third-party review of the cancer uh, drug system. Dr. Thiessen brought forward a report and recommendations. My constituents in Newmarket Aurora want to know how these recommendations are captured uh, in Bill 21. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I asked the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care how is the government addressing Dr. Thiessen's recommendations Question. to prevent a tragedy like this from happening again? Thank you. Minister. Thank you to the member from Newmarket Aurora for this very important supplementary question. And the member is correct when stating that no one should ever have to go through what the affected cancer patients and their families went through in this tragedy, Mr. Speaker. Following Dr. Jake Thiessen's report, our government accepted and endorsed all of his recommendations. And our legislation, Safeguarding Health Care Integrity Act, now enables our health regulatory colleges to share more information with hospitals and public health authorities so that we can prevent future incidents from affecting patient care. And Mr. Speaker, our le le legislation also reflects Dr. Thiessen's recommendation to authorize the College of Pharmacists to inspect and license all our hospital pharmacies operating in Ontario as a means to ensure that medication Sir. management and processing systems in hospital pharmacies are standardized. I'd like to thank every member in the House for thank supporting you. this very... 
Thank you. New question, the member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Okay, my question is to the Minister of Transportation. Speaker, the previous minister was so concerned last May about being unable to produce his high speed rail pre feasibility study. He pledged, quote, one of the first things we want to do if we're re-elected is get those studies out there, end quote. It may be one of the first things he wanted to do, but apparently the current minister didn't get that message. I had to wait two months after asking this House for the study to be produced before making an FOI request. I'm happy to report uh, that we now have the study uh, through FOI, but we found about 20 per cent of it. Uh, has been redacted, Speaker. Wow. In the spirit of openness and transparency, will the minister provide the missing information from page 48 under the heading "Could there be an integrated solution?" In the spirit of openness and transparency. Thank you, Mr. Transportation. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. As uh, as I always begin by saying, I want to thank the member from Kitchener for his question. I was. Um, I was really uh, thrill <coughs> thrilled to have the opportunity just a number of days ago, late last week, to be in London, Ontario, a wonderful community uh, that is uh, very lucky to be represented by the Deputy Premier and President of the Treasury Board. And at that particular uh, event, Speaker, we were uh, jointly uh, with uh, the Mayor of London, um, Mayor uh, Brown, announcing the launch of the environmental assessment process for the high-speed rail project, uh, which is very exciting news for London, for Kitchener-Waterloo, of course, for Windsor. In, fra in fact, Speaker. Great news for all of southwestern Ontario. As I said that day at the announcement, this is an environmental assessment that will take place over the next four to six years. It will help build on the work done in the pre-feasibility report that the member opposite is referencing. It will discuss items around technical requirements, Answer. technical options, the routing, the number of stations. But the bottom line, Speaker, is that the people of London, the people of Kitchener, the people of Windsor, the people right across Thank southwestern you. Ontario are very happy about Supplementary. You know, you must need like a special pair of glasses to see what's written in here. Right. But anyways, I know you want to talk about the EA for 2015. The same EA the Premier announced was already underway a few months ago. Fact is, the Wynn Liberals were so eager to label themselves as bullet train champions before the election, bullet man. they got a London-England firm, a first-class partnerships, to do a rust job to provide them high-speed rail credibility. In fact, FCP's Michael Shabas told CBC, quote, we did in two weeks what normally would take three to four months. Wow. They didn't even have time to examine the railroad in person, so FCP relied on Google Earth. Oh, this God. was nothing more than wow. a pre-election bid to get votes with $115,000 of taxpayers' money. Will the minister tell us why Question. we should take direction for a multi-billion dollar high-speed, high-risk transit project from a Russian Minister job of Energy. Thank you. Uh, thank, thanks very much, Speaker. I thought I heard that member at the beginning of his question suggest that somehow the EA was announced previously. Uh, in fact, it wasn't. We, we launched it last Friday. It's understandable from my perspective that that member would be confused about all of the good news coming from this government, particularly for Kitchener-Waterloo, for London, for Windsor, and for all of Ontario because of the very ambitious, robust transportation and transit infrastructure plan that we have, Speaker. But don't just take my word for it, Speaker. Let's actually look to see what the mayor, the new mayor of London, Matt Brown, said about the launch of the EA just last week. I want to quote the mayor of London, Matt Brown. He said, and I quote, Speaker, this is fantastic news for London. High-speed rail will benefit many vital, vital economic sectors in London, and we look forward to working with the province on this initiative, Speaker. I would have thought that that member would want to work with us to deliver yes, positive results for Kitchener, because that is the work that we are doing. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. Question. The member from Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Seven months ago, the Premier went to Walkerton, where seven people died 14 years ago due to drinking water contamination. She said, there was a failure of oversight, a failure of enforcement, cuts have consequences. In 2006, the government promised to protect our drinking water from con contamination at this source. This was a key recommendation of the Walker Walkerton Commission, and yet, when the Auditor General checked in eight years later, the government had approved plans to protect the drinking water of only 5 per cent of Ontarians. How hypocritical is it for the Premier to stand in Walkerton and say— The member will withdraw. I'll withdraw. 
How shameful is it for the Premier to stand in Walkerton and say cuts and poor oversight caused this tragedy when our own government is planning deep spending Question. cuts and has still not implemented key recommendations from the Walkerton Commission? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, well, and I appreciate the, uh, the question from the, uh, the member opposite. Um, Ontario is one of the only jurisdictions in North America with source water protection plans, Mr. Speaker. And these plans are one element, they're just one element in a robust water protection system that was put in place, Mr. Speaker, that ensures Ontario's uh, drinking water is among the best protected in North America. Um, so let me be clear, despite what the uh, Auditor General alludes to in a report, another Walkerton will not happen in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Follow the, following the Walkerton inquiry, uh, Justice O'Connor made 121 recommendations on areas related to protected drinking water. Uh, Ontario is acting on all 121 recommendations, every single one of them, Mr. Speaker, including the source water protection Answer. plans. By the end of this year, half of the water protection plans will be implemented, and the end of next year, all 22 plans will be implemented. Speaker, the government has still not approved the plan to protect the drinking water of the Credit Valley, Toronto Region and Central Lake Ontario area, representing more than half of the people in Ontario. This plan includes provisions to protect against pipeline spills. Because the government refuses to approve it, Enbridge has refused to follow the plan's safety rules for its Line 9 pipeline. Mm. The Auditor General wondered why this government's water safety plans did not protect against industrial spills. Perhaps it's for the same reason the government refuses to approve a water safety plan that would regulate pipelines. Deputy House Leader is why born. won't the government put public safety ahead of private interests and approve this plan to protect the drinking water of more than half of Ontario? The, the, the plans are in the process. As I said, by the end of the year, half of the uh, water protection plans will be implemented, and the end of next year, all 22 of the plans will be implemented. So they are in process, Mr. Speaker. That work is underway, and they, they have to be finalized in order for them to, uh, to be approved. And it's measures like these that are making us a leader in source water protection. And uh, quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, all over the world, there are jurisdictions that are looking to us for our clean water technology. When I traveled to China, there were businesses that were coming with us who have developed clean water technology because of the regulation, because of the system that we've put in place in Ontario. So, Mr. Speaker, we are leading the pack on this. Not all the plans are approved yet. That is absolutely true. And in terms of the, uh, in terms of the pipeline, yes, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite will know that just uh, a couple of weeks ago, we signed an agreement with Quebec that we are putting some principles in place Thank to you. make sure that environmental protections are put in place around the pipeline, Mr. Speaker. The member from Scarborough. I, Southwest. Scarborough's big. Southwest. Scarborough's Southwest. Well, it's correct, too. <laughs> it's a nice place to go. Uh, Mr. Uh, speaker, my question is to the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. According to the 2011 census, almost a quarter of First Nation people in Canada live in Ontario more than any other province. Some 80 percent of the Aboriginal population in Ontario lives off reserve, with 62 percent residing in urban centres. Aboriginal people living in urban centres experience lower social and economic status and poor quality of life than non-Aboriginal population in Toronto. Approximately 37,000 Aboriginal people are living in Toronto alone, including Scarborough Southwest, in large populations, Ottawa, Sudbury, Thunder Bay, and throughout Toronto. Mr. Speaker, through to the Minister, what is our government doing to support urban Aboriginal communities across the province? Good question. Thank you, Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question. Aboriginal people living in urban areas face unique challenges like higher unemployment rates, lower health status, and a lower rate of high school education compared to non-Aboriginal peoples. Over the past years, past two years, the Ministry of Aboriginal Affairs has undertaken a variety of initiatives to understand and alleviate some of these challenges. We have established the Off-Reserve Aboriginal Policy Engagement Table with the Ontario Federation of Indigenous Friendship Centres, the Ontario Native Women's Association, and the Métis Nation of Ontario. 
All this with a view to support policy development aimed at fostering sustainable, healthy and resilient urban Aboriginal communities. We will work with partners to closely develop and identify the work going forward. And for the 2014-15, the table's priority will focus on exploring policy opportunities related to literacy supports to urban and off-reserve Aboriginal Thank peoples. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, supplementary. I apologize to the member from Scarborough Southwest. I should have said that last two pieces. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate it very much. Place, Scarborough Southwest very gets mentioned in this house, but it's nice to hear you say that today. Uh, thank you, Minister. It's great to hear such good news. This really points out that the whole government approach that Ontario is taking to support the Aboriginal community is being done properly. We know that a constructive, cooperative relationship with the Aboriginal people in Ontario leads to improved opportunities and a better future, not only for Aboriginal people, but for all people living in Ontario, including Scarborough Southwest. I am aware that this year we launched the Urban Aboriginal Action Plan. I just want to ask the Minister, could you please inform the House on how the Action Plan will continue to support the urban Aboriginal people in Ontario? Good. Thank you, Minister. Well, I want to thank the member from Scarborough Southwest for that follow-up question. Look, the Urban Aboriginal Action Plan will support urban Aboriginal communities by providing $2.5 million in funding over the next three years to develop strategies that reflect local interests and lead to the improvement of local socioeconomic outcomes. And we will coordinate an engagement strategy with Aboriginal peoples, municipalities and the federal government, if they'll ever come to the table, to be able to better deliver programming directed towards Aboriginal communities. We also have selected two demonstration projects for community development initiatives in the next year. We will be partnering with the North Bay Friendship Centre to implement its strategic plan, and we will also be working with the Barry Area Native Advisory Council to conduct a community-driven needs assessment plan to research and develop a strategic plan. Thank you. Nice answer. New question. The member from Oxford. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Minister, Housing Services Corporation makes their money from charging affordable housing providers a premium on gas and insurance. In 2013, the CEO earned over $300,000, double what the CAO made four years ago, plus expenses of $65,000. That's enough to reopen seven affordable housing units that are boarded up because of disrepair. The chair of the board gets $375 per conference call. What? Minister, these are just two examples. This money was designated for affordable housing. Will you ask the Auditor General to perform a value for money audit, money audit to find out where this money is going? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the question. I'll tell you exactly what I. The, uh, no, 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 no. I want to bring it to your attention first. The member from Renfrew will withdraw. I withdraw. Hey, I think there's a W behind your name on my list. Carry on. Uh, I'm pleased to respond, Mr. Chairman. When the uh, Housing Services Corporation was set up by the previous government, there were no accountability provisions at all. In 2013, we brought in accountability provisions, including the requirement to file full reports with us, reports that I read. When I read the report and discovered some anomalies, I wrote to the board. The board chairman wrote back and indicated to me that uh, they will be complying with uh, the expense uh, regulations of cabinet and the other bodies here. Good. And uh, Thank you. One, one of the board... Sorry. The uh, member from Holloman Norfolk, in point of order. Speaker, this is, uh, I know it's not a point of order. I do wish to uh, introduce the members, Gallery, Graham, Lloyd, and also Bill Emmett, the uh, six-year chair, Dairy Farmers of Ontario. <laughs> yes, you're right, it's not a point of order, but he's from my riding, so I let it go. 
the uh, Premier on a point of order. order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And as this is our last opportunity to have our morning chat between 10.30 and 11.30 in 2014, I just want to take this opportunity to wish everyone in the House and staff and everyone who's here a very happy holiday. I know that uh, members are going back to their ridings, and there's uh, a lot of work to be done between now and, uh, and uh, the real break, but I do hope that uh, you will have an opportunity to spend time with your friends and families, and thank you very much, all of you, for the service that you provide to the people of Ontario. I'd like to. Uh I'd like to recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I, too, want to join with the Premier and with the, uh, I'm sure the Leader of the Third Party in wishing everyone a Merry Christmas and a Happy Holidays and, uh, happy if possible, some prosperity in the new year. <laughs> <laughs> and um, on behalf of the, uh, on the PC Caucus, and of course, uh, Happy Holidays and Happy Hanukkah to all the people <laughs> of, uh, of Ontario. Uh, may you enjoy the, uh, the warmth of the season and the gathering of good friends and family as you celebrate the, uh, the birth of Christ. And on that note, Premier, if you're thinking of giving me a Christmas gift, which I hope you are, all you have to do is pass my Christmas tree day out. <laughs> To, I'd also like to recognize the leader of the third party on the same point of order. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. You know, the holidays are a time for friends and for family, uh, for cherishing our relationships, for rekindling old relationships and perhaps establishing new ones. I think that uh, on behalf of New Democrats, I want to express our desire that everyone who is involved in this legislature, uh, whether it's as staff, uh, as members, uh, as pages, uh, and in fact all Ontarians, uh, we want to wish you all some peace, some joy, some prosperity uh, for, uh, for the future. Uh, and most of all, I want to say that I hope everyone has a safe holiday season speaker, one that has a lot of joy but one that is also a safe one. Uh, season's greetings. Happy holidays to everyone. Thank you. I do know the, uh, the member from Prince Edward Hastings has a point of order, and I opened up a Pandora's box, I believe. Uh, no Christmas greetings, uh, but, but I do wish everybody a Merry Christmas and a Happy Holidays. Uh, I just received a note from a former colleague of ours here at the Legislature. Uh, Rob Milligan, the former member from Northumberland, Quinty West, was bringing his Grade 10 civics class, along with uh, Mrs. Carolyn Campbell, uh, down to view our question period this morning, but they're stuck on the 401 in the winter storm out there. So I'm sure that the crew, when they arrive, will be uh, visiting our transportation minister, just wondering where that extra equipment is on our. <laughs> on the, uh, the, the spirit of the House and uh, the cringing of the table because I'm actually supposed to be moving right into uh, deferred votes. Uh, I want to announce to the members a very special and uh, sorrowful note that this is the last day for our pages, and I think we should say to them. I'm sure that you join me in saying thank you very much to our pages for the next page. Still some business. <laughs> there still is some business to do. We do have deferred votes on the motion of third reading of Bill 7, an act to enact the Burden Reduction Reporting Act 2014 and the Partnerships for Jobs and Growth Act 2014. Calling the members, this will be a five minute bill.
Would all members please take their seats? All members, please take your seats. Finally, three, three, three times in a row. On December 10th, Mr. Leo moved third reading of Bill 7. All those in favour, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Nackby. Mr. Nackby. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Madame Mayor. Madame Mayor. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandler. Ms. Sanders. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Manga. Mr. Pratt, Mr. Pratt, Ms. Wong, Ms. Hunter, Ms. Hunter, Mr. Morrow, Mr. Morrow, Ms. Jassen, Mr. Jassen, Mr. Del Duca, Mr. Del Duca, Ms. Domerla, Ms. Domerla, Mr. Fraser, Mr. Fraser, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Baker, Mr. Baker, Mr. Ballard, Mr. Ballard, Mr. Dong, Mr. Dong, Ms. Hogarth, Ms. Hogarth, Ms. Koala, Ms. Koala, Madame Lalonde, Madame Lalonde, Ms. Molly, Ms. Molly, Mrs. Martin, Mrs. Martin, Mrs. McGarry, Mrs. McGarry, Ms. McMahon, Ms. McMahon, Mr. Milchin, Mr. Milchin, Ms. Nidu Harris, Ms. Nidu Harris, Mr. Potts, Mr. Potts, Mr. Rinaldi, Mr. Rinaldi, Ms. Verniel, Ms. Verniel. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Mr. Huda. Mr. Huda. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. <laughs> Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. Mc... Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Gates. Oh. Mr. Gates. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Satler. Ms. Satler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. being 88 and the nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. Third reading of the bill, Chosium Lecture Provision Law. Be it resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. We have another deferred vote. We have a deferred vote on the motion of third reading of Bill 35, an act to repeal the Public Works Protection Act, amended by the Police Services Act, amend the Police Services Act with respect to port security and act of security for electricity generating facilities and nuclear facilities act 2014 calling the members this will be a five-minute bell same vote no On December 10th, Mr. Flynn moved third reading of Bill 35. All those in favour, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. 
Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Madame Mayor. Madame Mayor. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Balkus. Mr. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Manga. Mr. Pratt. Mr. Pratt. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassa. Ms. Jassa. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Nidu Harris. Mr. Nidu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Verniel. Mr. Verniel. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Ms. Thompson. I will. Let me withdraw. All those in favor, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Miller, Perry Sound, Muskoka. Mr. Miller, Perry Sound, Muskoka. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Urich. Mr. Urich. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. All those opposed, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. It should be so. It should be so. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Vanto. Mr. Vanto. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. The nays are 15. The ayes being 73 and the nays being 15, I declare the motion carried. Third reading of the bill, Twasi and Lecture, Proje de Law. We resolve that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. We have a, another deferred vote. We have a deferred vote on the motion by Mr. Gravel respecting Sir John A. Macdonald calling the members. This will be a five minute bell. On the occasion of the upcoming bicentennial of his birth, this House commemorates the contribution of, to Canada of its founding father and first Prime Minister, Sir John E. Macdonald. All those in favour, please rise one at a time be recognised by the clerk. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Madame Mayor. Madame Mayor. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Duga. Mr. Duga. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Torzetti. Mr. Torzetti. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. 
Mr. Delaney. Mr. Balkasis. Mr. Balkasis. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Pratt. Mr. Pratt. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Darmerla. Ms. Darmerla. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Marley. Ms. Marley. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Naidu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Vanto. Mr. Vanto. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. All those opposed, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. The ayes being 89 and the nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. There are, uh, there are no further deferred votes. I do want to take liberty and indicate to you that I wish all of you uh, Merry Christmas, season's greetings, Happy New Year. Take care of your families. Make sure that they are taken care of because they take care of you. And I thank all of you for the work that you do in this province. Thank you very much. This house stands recessed.